we're going to we're get into a series this week, guys, on attitudes. And in each week, as we go through this series, we're going to be looking at different different aspects of our personal attitudes that uh, that represent an attitude of Christ. Okay. Now, if you're following along in your worship guides this week, you'll notice the worship guides are changed a little bit again. And, and I'm going to let you know I'm going to keep changing them a little bit and a little bit because I got some ideas and I want them to, to, to continue the change and I'm getting some input. And, and over time, they're going to be even better and even cooler. Um, you'll notice that the Bible references, all Bible verses I'll be using today can be found on your normal notes page inside of your folded worship guide as well as some space to take notes. Then you have an insert. On one side of the insert are the fill in the blanks to follow along with my message as I've done in the past. If you flip that over, it's got something that some of you might think is familiar because we used to do this a long time ago. And we're going to test it. We might start doing it again to give you a resource to help you connect with God. And it's called My Next Steps. Okay? On My Next Steps, we're going to see some next steps that you can take that have to do with what God's going to speak about today, including giving your life to Christ if you haven't. If none of these next steps are what God speaks to you today, write it in. Okay? You can do one of two things with this. You can keep this... And you can look back at it as you're... Con because the thing about a next step, I want you to understand, is it's a step. It means it's a motion. It means it's a verb. It means you're in action. So, it doesn't stop when you leave here. It's a step. It's the, it, when you take a step, you don't go back. You're going forward. We don't go backwards in our relationship with Christ. We go forward. So, when you take a next step today, whatever you might choose, maybe God speaks something else to you, I promise you His Word will not return void. The Bible tells us that. Take that step. Keep this paper with you. Look back at your notes. Look back at what God spoke to you. And remember that next step you chose to take. You can do that or you can do a second thing. You can take that next step. If you would like to be contacted about that next step or prayed about for that next step, take that next step. Make sure you put your name on it. Drop it off in the black mailbox. Myself or another leader in our church, part of our leadership team, someone like that, will come and talk with you, will pray for you, talk it over with you. Then we will take that paper and we will give it back to you. So you can still keep it and use it as a resource to continue your next step. Okay? So you can do one of those two things. You can keep it personal or you can, you can hand it over to us through the mailbox. We will contact you. We will talk to you about whatever you need to talk about. Then we'll give it back to keep that resource. If you give your life to Christ or as you might invite someone in the future and they give their life to Christ, make sure you encourage them to drop that off in the mailbox because when people give their life to Christ, we need to be able to contact them. Or if they're thinking about giving their life to Christ, we need to be able to contact them, to talk with them, to pray with them, to give them the resources not to feel alone and to take their next next steps in the start of a real relationship with a real God, okay? So that's a new resource that we're going to have as we follow along. We're going to start with this attitude. You might see things change week by week. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm test driving some things that I want, I want to do in the future, okay? But we're going to start in the series Attitude, and, and um, <clears throat> this is something that God kind of spoke to me, and it made me think about my... Um, as I've been planning this series and as God has started to form this series in my head, and I was thinking about my childhood and growing up. And, and in my, kid, my, my childhood, okay, as you, many of you know, I'm one of nine kids, okay? I have two adopted sisters currently in the middle of the adoption process, and then there's, there's seven more of us. And there was always five of us at home, okay? Until my two little sisters, I was always the baby. I'm still called the baby, even though I, I have two younger si siblings now. Um, but... There was always five of us at home. And there was a lot of phrases. When you have a house of five kids at home, there's a lot of phrases that get said over and over again. And you parents, whether you're a parent of one or you're a parent of, of, of nine, you know some of the phrases you can remember with your kids or that you're currently using with your kids. My son's only five months old. And I already got some phrases that I use with him. Like, come on, son, get with it. You know, like... Or go back to sleep, you know, something like that. No, um, but th there's phrases you can remember, and there's things I can remember growing up. You get home, and the phrase that hits you is from older sister Charity, the older sister who lived at home. I had one more older sister from that, Tiffany. But Charity, the first thing she would say when we get home, she was our babysitter, was look at the chore list. That's a phrase that stuck in my head. Look at the chore list. So I go look at the chore list. Oh man, I got dishes today. <sighs> All right, I'll go do the dishes. Another phrase I can remember that happened once or four times in a school year was, let me see your report card. Sometimes that was good. Sometimes that was bad. We'll just leave it at that. Okay? Another phrase I can remember is, it's dinner time. Wash your hands. 
That's a, that was a big phrase. Or it's family time. Turn off the Xbox. That was another big phrase in our house. Um, that, yeah, Michael's like, oh, yeah, I know that phrase. Um, so there's a lot of those, those phrases. Uh, don't sit on the arm of the chair. I, I still get told that one sometimes. Okay? Um, don't sit on the arm of the chair. Things like that. Take off your shoes. Things like that. Okay? And then there's just one phrase that, that was actually more common with my mom than my dad. Okay? Um, that, that I can remember hearing quite a bit especially according to where my mood was. And that attitude was a, 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 a low voice with a puckered mouth looking right in the eyes. And it was this. Watch the attitude. Yes, Mom. I'm going to watch my attitude. I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to clean my room and I'm going to turn off the TV and I'm going to do my homework. You know, that's all it took. Watch the attitude. Now, my dad, my dad was a little um, quieter, didn't, it wasn't really as much the punisher, so uh, he didn't ever really get to watch the attitude. You were just like, I made dad way too mad. But uh, mom, she watched the attitude. You knew, you knew those signs. That was one of those phrases. There was like, time to change, time to rethink my thought process, right? Watch that attitude. Watch how you're talking to me. Don't back talk to me. Respect me. Don't treat me that way. That's what that meant. Don't act like that in public. You were raised better than that. There's a, th a thousand other phrases that come to my mind as I think of the simple phrase, watch the attitude. Today, as we start this series, attitude or attitude adjustment or whatever you want to say, I want us to remember that phrase. I want you to imagine your dad, your father, your God, Abba, looking you in the eyes, puckering his lips and going, watch the attitude. Because I'm telling you guys, as Christ followers, we've got to learn to watch our attitudes. We've got to learn to watch how we represent ourselves, how we exert ourselves in public, okay? We have to watch what we do and how we treat ourselves and other people. An attitude is simply this. Our attitude is our mood. It's how we are acting currently. It's how we choose to act on a daily basis. Some of us have a daily attitude. Some of us, our normal attitude is that we're quiet, Reserved people. That's our attitude. We're reserved. That's natural. For people like me, you're the exact opposite. Your attitude is you're bubbly, you're out there, you're always moving, you're always talking, you're always going. You're a social butterfly, okay? That's your attitude. That's your mood. That's natural. Now, for some of us, we have um, mood swings. And by some of us, I mean all of us. Sometimes our attitudes can change without us expecting us, without us knowing it. Sometimes things can happen in our lives quickly or someone can say something to us just like that or we get some news just like that and all of a sudden our attitude completely changes. Maybe we were in a bad mood. Okay, I know one of the best ways to help my wife out of a bad mood is, is, is some flowers. Okay, she loves flowers. I know one of the best ways to put my wife in a loving mood is to get her some flowers, to, to text her and tell her I miss her and to make her feel loved and that can change her attitude just like that. I also know that my wife can go from a bad mood to a good mood or excuse me, a good mood to a bad mood when I don't do what I said I was going to do. When I say I'm going to do the dishes for her and she comes home and she's like, you said you were going to do the dishes two days ago and they stink, you know? That can put her in a bad mood just like that. Attitudes can change. Maybe you get some tragic information and you're having a great day and now your attitude is sorrow and pain. Okay? Attitudes is an emotion thing. Attitudes are driven by how we feel, by what we've been through, and how we look at our daily lives. Our attitude is driven by our perspective. Have you ever heard the term cup half full or cup half empty? That's an attitude thing. My perspective. Am I going to be a negative person or am I going to be a positive person? Our attitudes are, 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 are encompassed in all of this. So what I want us to do is I want us to choose. The, the, it was brought up in our huddle time today as, as some people have been watching these videos called the parables, which are based off of, off of books. And, and it brought back this old phrase from when I was a, a kid and a teenager, and it was WWJD. What would Jesus do? Now, I know that that's kind of corny and it's kind of out of the cultural realm to go w, to wear the WWJD bracelets anymore. That's fine. But the concept is still 
true because Christ says to follow me. Christ says to imitate me. Christ says, hey, I am setting the example for you. So what we need to do is we need to learn to watch our attitudes. We need to learn to shift our perspective towards a Christ-like attitude. And there's a lot of different perspectives on that. There's a lot of different aspects to that. And so today, we're going to talk about one that uh, maybe will step on your toes. I don't know. But it's one that we're going to, we got to talk about and we're opening with for a specific reason, and I'll get to that in a second. Today's attitude that we're going to discuss is humbleness and humility. Humbleness and humility. Okay? This is, this is a big one. Here's the reason why we are, we're starting with this. Okay? In order to allow God to actually talk to you, in order to allow God to actually pierce your heart and, and, and to lay a foundation inside of you, in order to actually let Him do something for you, you have to humble yourself. You have to set yourself aside. You have to let Him have complete and utter control. It's not about me. It's about God. That's why we're starting with humbleness and humility. Now, before I go any further into that, I want us to understand two things about all the attitudes that we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks. If you're following along in your worship guides, you're going to see these at, at the top. I believe I put these at the top of your worship guide. If I didn't, they're on the screen. There's two things about every attitude that we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks um, that will be true for every one of these attitudes. Okay, And the two things are this. First, the Bible will define it. Okay? These are things that are biblical. These are things that are of God. These are things that He wants us to focus on. So, if we look at a, a particular attitude of Christ, or a particular attitude that we need to have, then God's going to have defined it somewhere in His Word, where we can dive into the Word of God, and we can find Him giving an explanation of what it means to have this kind of attitude. Okay? It will be in God's Word somewhere. The second thing is this. Jesus lived it. He set the example. He did this. He led by example. Okay, So we're going to be able to see a definition of what it is, and we're going to be able to see it put into practice in the life of Christ. Those two things will be in all of these. And, and that's important. Okay, Because this has got to be about God. This has got to be about what He wants us to do. And this has got to be about becoming more Christ-like in representing Jesus and discipling, which means to reach out and to touch people's lives in our community because of our relationship with Jesus. Okay, So, humbleness and humility. A quick definition for humbleness and humility is this. Having or showing a modest or low esteem of one's own importance. Okay? Having or showing a modest or low, low esteem of one's importance. Basically, you put others before yourself. Humbleness and humility. You, you don't see yourself up here on this pedestal. Okay? You don't see yourself up way high in the sky. You see yourself on a level ground with everybody else or lower than everybody else. That's what humbleness is. Okay? Humbleness is putting others before yourself. Now, we're going to talk about break down some aspects of what humbleness is here in just a minute. But I want to go into the Bible and I want to do for you guys exactly what I just said that I would do. And I want us to see in the Bible where this is but not only a one Bible passage where it not only defines humbleness and humility, but it shows us that Christ lived it in His life. Okay, Philippians chapter 2 at verse 3 says this, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be Humble, okay? It's defining humbleness. Not, don't be selfish. Don't put yourself before others. Don't worry and try to impress others all the time. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude. Oh, whoa. There's that word, right? Have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave or a servant and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself 
in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Anyone um, ever used the word humiliate before? Have your kids ever humiliated you in public? Come on, be honest. You ever been that, been that embarrassed in public? Oh, I'm so humiliated. Humiliated. Yeah, I'm so embarrassed right now. Okay? The word hu- humility literally means the same thing as humbleness. It means to have a low sense of who you are. Can you imagine, in both senses of the word, humbleness and being humiliated in public or being embarrassed or being um, made fun of, whatever you want to say it, how humiliated Jesus must have felt on the cross. Naked, beaten, bloodied, hanging before his own mother, dying. That's humility. Listen, Christ lived humbleness. Christ lived humility. Christ put himself at the bottom of the totem pole. Why? For our sake. So that you could be saved. He said, hey, I am God. But I'm not even going to try to be have equality with God the Father right now. I'm going to humble myself as a human being. And you know what? As a human being, even as a human, all I'd have to do is snap my fingers and I could break your leg if I wanted to. Honestly, that's what kind of power I have, Christ says. Christ didn't exactly say He was going to break your leg, but He does have that power. He's God. He can do whatever He wants. But He says, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to perform miracles. I'm going to teach. I'm going to humble myself. I'm not just going to come as a human being, but the Bible says that there were no physical features about the man, Jesus Christ, that would have stood out to anybody. So not only did He come as a human being, but He didn't, even, he didn't come as like this chiseled, jawled, jawled blonde hair, blue-eyed, six-pack ab guy that we see in the paintings and on posters and stuff, okay? It says there was no physical features about Him that would have attracted you to Him. He humbled Himself. He lived it. He served. Before he ever even started preaching, before he ever even started performing miracles, his first miracle ever, he was serving his mother. His mom came to him and said, we're out of wine. And he looks at her and says, it's not my time. But when those big eyes of his mom looked him back, he said, all right, I'm going to serve you. For your sake, for my love for you, I'll perform this miracle. It's not even on the timeline of what I was going to do. But I'll do it anyway. To serve you. Because I love you that much. And because I care more about you than I care about myself. From the moment he started, Jesus was a humble man. And we, we need to follow that by example. Humbleness is not easy to come by. It's not. We're going to talk about that. It, it's hard. It is one of the hardest things in the world because here's why most of the time in order to find humbleness we've got to be knocked down a peg okay we've got to have our feet taken out from underneath us and most of us not big fans of that are we we don't want to lose our footing we don't want to show um, that we're that we're weak we don't want to show that we're not able we don't want to admit that we are wrong we don't want to admit where we need help but in order to be humble we're going to have to learn to do that all. So what is humbleness? Okay? This is where I want us to really dive in. I want you to be paying attention here. Open your heart and hear this. This is what humbleness is. The first thing that humbleness is is this. A lack of pride. Straight up. Humbleness is a lack of pride. It's being void of pride completely. The Bible says this in the book of Proverbs. It says that pride comes before destruction. And a haughty spirit, spirit or a prideful spirit or a prideful attitude comes before the fall. Okay? Humbleness is a complete lack of pride. Let me share a story with you where I uh, went from being very prideful to being humbled, okay, real quickly. Uh, when I lived at Ava, I got the opportunity to coach Mighty Mike's football. One of the funnest things I'd ever done in my life. Just love it. Would love to do it again someday. And I coached Mighty Mike's football third and fourth grade one year. And I had a phenomenal team. Just amazing team. I had this assistant coach uh, who, who was uh, just a whiz at football. Um, his boy was our quarterback. And that kid was just a brick wall. I mean, it was unbelievable. The whole team was amazing. And we didn't get, we didn't get scored on once in our entire season until the very last game of the year. We played the other Ava team. There was three Ava teams. And two of us had gone undefeated. And the other Ava team scored on us once. 
once the entire game. It was the only time we got scored on the entire year. Okay? And this was like, I think we did like eight games. I mean, for third and fourth grade, it was, it was six, something like that. For third and fourth grade, that was awesome. I mean, it was phenomenal. And man, was I proud. Now, there's two different types of, of, of being proud. Let me, let me clear that up. There's two different types of being proud in our culture. Okay? You can be proud of your son or your daughter, of their accomplishments. It's not having pride. Look at me. Look at my son. It's, wow. I am so proud of them. I am so grateful for them. I am so impressed by them. Not by me, but by them. So I'm proud of my son because I'm not impressed with my parenting skills. I'm impressed with the man that my son has become or the woman that my daughter has become. So that's, that's, a, that's a cultural term where we use pride and proud. That's not the biblical term for pride and for being proud. Okay? When we talk about biblical, it means, hey, my team was undefeated. The team I was the head coach of went undefeated. You, were, you should have saw, I taught them how to run two different defenses. They were third and fourth graders. And I could call 3-4, three, 3-4, four, three, four, six, two, six, two, and they were moving like high school, you know, all-state players, baby. They were just awesome. And I taught them, because I was a defense guy, so I taught them that. And I was so proud of it. Man, I went undefeated. And that was awesome. And it, it was just the coolest thing. It made me think of when I was in 7th and 8th grade. My 7th and 8th grade team went completely undefeated. All the way up, not just 7th and 8th grade, but through our freshman year. I didn't play freshman ball, but they went undefeated all the way through the freshman year. And I remember that. And I was so proud. And I was so excited. And I was ready to come back. And I thought, I did, we did such a good job. I've learned so much about coaching. Next year, I'm going to coach the big boys. I'm going to do 5th and 6th grade. And I got to be the assistant coach for one of my friends in 5th and 6th grade. And uh, we didn't score the whole year. <laughs> not once. Not once. We got close in our last game. We were like on the five-yard line, and we just couldn't quite get it in. So as you can probably imagine, since we didn't score the whole year, we didn't win the whole year. So I went one year to another from look at how great my team is to we're in last place. Now, these boys were great athletes. A lot of them hadn't played before. We got a lot of new kids. We were teaching them, okay? And they did a great job. They had a good time, and it, it was a, still a great year. But talk about having your legs kicked out from underneath you. Talk about being knocked down a peg. Talk about going from prideful to humbleness. I realized, wow, hey, evidently I'm really not this uh, miracle coach. Um, and then I started thinking about my assistant coach, Casey Johnson, I, from the year before, and I thought, he probably should have been the head coach because he was a lot better than I was, right? And I became very humble. And that was my last year coaching, my 0-6 season, last year. Humbling experience. Realize, hey, you know what? This isn't about me. This is about these boys. I was, I, I was, I was retaught what it was about. The thing about humbleness is when we choose to be humble, we must completely rid ourselves of pride. And when we rid ourselves of our personal pride, what happens there is that we have just taken a big old ball of black tar and we have removed it from our hearts. And we have now given God this giant space in our hearts to fill with what He wants us to know. See, if I wouldn't have went 0 and 6 after my 6 and 0 season, or my 0 and 8 after 8 and 0 season, I probably would have ended my last year thinking, "Man, I was such a great coach." Instead, I ended up ended it remembering, "Man, I'm so glad these boys have a football program." Man, I'm so glad. I remember I was I was involved in the first year of Mighty Mites came to Ava. I was in I was in third grade. Man, I'm so glad, glad these boys have this program. Man, I'm so glad that they're working with the high school and making a good football program all the way through the high school. Man, I'm so glad that kids that I got the chance to coach are all state athletes. And kids that I got the chance to play with are, are going to the school on scholarships. And that never happened in Ava before. And all of a sudden it's starting to happen with my generation and the, and the few just right behind me and the ones that are in high school now that I coached. And it's just like, wow, that's the reason for this. If I didn't have that big old black tar piece of pride ripped out of my heart, God could never have filled me up with that knowledge that, hey, remember what this is about. Listen, as Christ followers, as, as Christ followers, we have to remove our pride completely. We have to remove our personal opinion, opinions from the issue. It doesn't matter what it's about. 
from the music that's picked to the outreach events that are, are, are coordinated at our church to the, to the Bible studies that we do at home to the, to the co-workers that we have to put up with and everything in between we have to remove our tar our pride and yank it out of our hearts and say listen this isn't about me this isn't about me this is about God. My life is about God. So my opinion is not as important as what God wants to happen. My opinion on how this should happen, or my opinion on how my life should be ran, or my opinion on what my kids should do with their lives, or, or my opinions on, 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 on what should happen on Sunday mornings, or my opinion on how my co-workers should be, and I'm telling you, I'm struggling with that one some. I'm just going to be honest with you right now. My opinion on what my co-workers should be doing, my opinion on how my finances should be spent, my opinion on what I should be doing when I wake up, and what time I wake up, and what time I go to bed, my opinion on all that stuff really doesn't matter that much. God's opinion matters. And if God speaks to me through somebody else, I probably ought to listen to Him. Because God's opinion matters more than mine. And if God speaks to me through His Word, I probably ought to listen to Him. I probably ought to set my pride aside and let Him talk to me. If God speaks to me through a rally, then I probably ought to listen to Him. If God sends me down by the lake to listen to Michelle on the 25th of June with a bunch of other ladies, and He starts talking to me, I probably ought to put my personal opinion, my personal church denomination, my personal background, my personal relationship aside and let God talk to me. Because I have this ball of gunk that I can't push out. And I need Him to remove it from my life before my feet are chopped out from underneath me. Because here's the thing about letting God take away your pride. It hurts. I'm, gonna, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to talk about that at the end here in just a minute, okay? The Bible says this in James chapter 4, verse 6. It says, God opposes the proud. Now listen to that statement right there. Think about that. Oh, God would never oppose me. Do you have pride in your life? How valued is your opinion above other people's? How often do you care more about yourself than others? If right now, in your mind, you're thinking, yeah, that person is so prideful. you got a pride issue. Okay? Straight up. Stop thinking about other people. This isn't about them today. This is about us. This is about our hearts. This is about my relationship with God. This is about my salvation and my eternity. Nobody else's. This is about yours. So if right now you're thinking, yeah, that person needs to hear this or that person has this problem, you better be pulling the tar out of your heart right now and listening to God. God opposes the pride. The proud. What, is a, to, what does it mean to oppose? To be against. They are the enemy. They are the other team. They are the ones we're trying to defeat. So when we become prideful, we become, and I'm going to be blunt with you here, guys, you know, I'm not going to like to hear this, but when we have pride in our hearts, we become the opposition of God. We become the enemy of God. Why? Because we are standing in His way of truly reaching people. Peter, one of the disciples, whenever Jesus said, "You will divine," when Jesus said, "You will all leave me," and, I, and uh, excuse me if I'm getting the story a little wrong, but if I remember it right, Peter was the one who stood up and said, "Oh no, I won't be the one to leave you." And Peter showed pride. And what did Jesus say? Away from me, Satan! Get away from me! You just become my opposition because of your pride. He called Peter the work of the devil. This is the guy who led our church, guys. This is the guy who was chosen to lead the Christian church. He said, away from me, Satan, because you just became my opposition because of the pride that is in your heart. Now, you remove that pride, and then you can come back to my side of the team. You can come back on this side. But until then, you get away from me because you're my opposition. You're my enemy. Guys, we become the enemy of God straight up when we have pride in our heart. Why? Because God says, I love you, but I will not let your pride, I will not let your lofty attitude, I will not let your haughty spirit stand in the way of reaching these people because their souls mean more to me than your opinion. That's what God's saying right now. So God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble couple of weeks we're going to talk about the an attitude of grace and what that looks like God has the attitude of grace what is grace I'm paying a lot of bills right now and one of the bills that I love the most 
um, the pay and hate the most at the same time is our student loans. I hate them because I hate the amount that I have to pay every month on them. I love them because they give you a one month grace period before they report it to the credit bureau. <laughs> and so if you're a little behind, it's not a big deal. Same thing with my health insurance. I hate to have to pay another bill. I love having health insurance. I also love that you can go up to three months behind on your payments and they will still run you, run you your prescription. Okay? I try not to let that happen. I did forget about it recently. I'll be honest with you. Screwed some things up. But they give you a grace period. What does that mean? It means that they, hey, it's all right. I'll forgive you. It's okay. I can look past your faults. I will still trust you beyond your sin. God says, if you're prideful, you're my enemy. But if you are humble, I will show you grace like you've never seen. Doesn't matter the sin, I will forgive it. Doesn't matter the mess up, I will be there. Doesn't matter the problem, I will fix it. I will show you grace. God opposes the prideful, but shows grace to those that are humble. So the humbleness is a complete and utter lack of pride. My prayer is today that you will remove all pride from your life and remember what we're here for. Remember what you do. Remember what Christ is about in your life. The second thing is this. And this, is, this, is, this one is both a kind of debunking a misconception about, um, about humbleness and, and stating a fact about humbleness at the same time. Okay, So listen to this. Humbleness is not a lack of self-worth, but is a lack of self-importance. And we think, well, what's the difference? Okay, we're going to talk about that. What's the difference between self-worth and self-importance? Okay, the, the, there's this misconception in order to be humble, in order to be at the bottom, in order to be humbled by God, that we have to hate ourselves. Okay, I have to hate who I am. Listen, don't hate who you are. God made you who you are for a purpose. The good things about you are of God. The bad things are a part of sin, but God forgives those. Okay? It's okay. God made you who you are for a purpose. God made you for a reason. Okay? Humbleness is not a lack of self-worth. In fact, Jesus says this. He says, you are worth more than me to me than anything else in this world. You have more worth in the eyes of God than anything He has ever created. John 3.16 says God loved the world. And when He says the world, He doesn't mean the, the, the earth. He doesn't mean the sin. He, he means the people. God loved the world so much that He gave His only Son that whoever would believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 15.13 um, 15, Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. The book of Romans says the payment for sin is death. The penalty. The price. You have a price. You are worth something to God. James 1.18 says this. Bring that up for me. He chose to give birth to us by giving us His true word. And we, we, the human race, both those who believe and those who don't, everyone in between, we as the human race, out of all creation, became His prized possession. His prized possession. Listen. Well, think, think of all the things you have. Think about your prized possession. My prized possessions have changed over the years. Okay? When I was 12, my prized possession was my Nintendo 64. Got it when we got it for Christmas. Before that, when I was eight, it was my Sega Genesis that we got for Christmas. Okay? When I was 14, it was the pool table that we got for Christmas. Okay? When I was 16, it was my 1986 Ford Bronco that I bought for 200 bucks, had rust around the tire wells, four, four wheel drive low was a little shoddy, and it got five, five to ten miles to the gallon. And it was my prized possession. Okay? Then I turned 17, and I met this pretty little brunette girl. And guess what became my prized possession? That pretty little brunette girl. Second was my Volvo, A50 Turbo. It was an awesome car. But, but Shanda was first. <laughs> Obviously, Jesus is always at the top. But this is after Jesus, okay? And then as I got older and, and, and I married that prized possession, then we have our son. And we both agreed that, hey, I love you. And we'd say this to each other, I love you. I love you with all my heart. But I love him more. 
And we're okay with that. I'm okay that my wife loves him more than me because I love him more than her. And we, we, we feel that's the, what God wants from us. Why? Because we're called to be parents. And, and we're called to put that kid before anything else. He's our prized possession, in my opinion. My wife comes after that, right after that, about an inch away. But man, I'm going to do anything for that kid. And she's going to do anything for that kid, even if it means hurting me for that kid. And that's why I want it. It's my prized possession. Jesus says, listen, I've got a bunch of creation. I created the whole universe. Okay? I created infinite amounts of space that you haven't even discovered. You don't even know the, the, the galaxies and the atmospheres and, and the stars and, and the solar systems out there that have no other purpose but to praise my great name, as the book of Proverbs says. And guess what? I love you more. I love you more than it all. I love you more than anything in this world. You are not worthless. Listen. I bought this laptop up here for a reason. And I'm going to go long today and I'm not going to apologize. I really don't care. This laptop was bought for my wife when she was in college through her college grant money. Okay? This laptop cost $1,000. Now, we lost the, extension, the, the power cord to this thing after it had been in use for about nine months and it didn't get used for almost two years. So it's almost brand new. It's only been used for about another year now. Okay? So it's still pretty new. So I could probably turn around, wipe this clean, put Windows 7 back on it, or upgrade it to Windows 8, and probably sell it for close to what I bought for it still, to be honest with you, because it's still in good shape. It's still a good laptop. Holds battery life like, like nothing. Okay? It's got a large processor. It's got a lot of memory built in. It's a great Samsung laptop. We paid $1,000 for it. We paid $150 for a virus protector on it. It, it, it has worth. Okay? This is not worthless to us. This has a price tag on it. We have a price tag on us. That price tag is death. Jesus said, you're worth so much to me, I will die for you. And Jesus did that knowing that what if he didn't overcome the grave? What if he didn't defeat Satan and he was God and now he has to burn in hell for us? Right? He did. He did overcome it. He had the confidence he could. Why? Because he's God. But what if he didn't? He still would have died. He would have burned in hell for you. That's how much you're worth to Jesus. So, humbleness is not a lack of self-worth. It's not hating yourself. But, it is a lack of self-importance. This same laptop, $1,000 laptop, has a pretty big price tag on it. But, by all true means, even though I could sell it for a good price, considering new technology, it's technically obsolete. There are laptops out there that could do its job better than it can. There are laptops out there I could buy today for $1,000 that could probably do twice as much as this one does, okay? I'll be honest if I wanted to. There's tablets. There's two-in-ones. There's surfaces. There's iPads, okay? There's phones that are the size of the palm of my hand that run like miniature laptops, okay? So, this might have a worth to it, but in all honesty, it's of importance as long as I've backed up my data so that I can put it on another laptop. It's importance really isn't that high. Why? Because it's one in a million. In fact, not only is it one in a million, there are things that could do it better. They could do its job better than it does. But what? But, but am I going to go buy one of those? Heck no. Because this, this is the one I chose. Well, I didn't choose it. My wife chose it. And then she said, hey, you can use it as a work laptop since I don't need it right now. That's the one I chose, though. That's the one we chose to do its job. We could have chose a million other laptops and we almost did when it was brand new. But we chose it. Its importance, the la that laptop's importance is pretty much zero because there's a thousand, a million other things that could do its job. But its worth is high. Listen, you are not worthless to God. But I'm going to be honest with you, your importance, not very high because there's billions of people on this earth. God has chosen you for a purpose. God chose me, humbly I say this, to be the leader of the bridge right now. God chose me to be the pastor of the bridge. He didn't choose you. He chose me. Okay, I don't take that lightly. But He chose me. And I have that responsibility. But, there are probably hundreds of thousands of people who have more skills than I do and could probably give up and deliver a better message, could organize a better schedule, and could handle, handle responsibility better than I can. There's about a thousand, a million more people that are on the same level as I am. There's about a thousand million more people who have more potential to be raised up to be a better leader than I am. And I'm, I'm saying that honestly. I know some of them, and I'm not, I'm not too prideful to say that, okay? I'm not the best person in the world, okay? 
Billy Graham's 90 years old, and he could probably still lead, lead a modern church better than I can, okay? And that's okay. My importance isn't very high. God could have chose anybody else to do my job. God has called you for a purpose, but He could cho choose anybody else to do your job. In fact, if we are too prideful to remove ourselves and let Him tell us what He wants from us, He will choose somebody else to do our job because He's going to get His way one, or, one way or another because He's God. But here's the great thing about it. As, as, as little of importance as we really have in this world, He still chose you. He chose you to bring you out of the slum. He chose to save you. He chose to save your marriage. He chose to save your finances. He chose to save your kids. He chose to save your life in whatever means necessary. He chose you. He didn't have to, but He did. That, <laughs> as, as, as little as I am, and He chose me, as unimportant as I am, as many people who could do my job better, and He chose me. If that doesn't humble you, I don't know what will. Romans 12.16 says this, Live in harmony with each other, and don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people, and don't think you know it all. When it says ordinary people, it's talking about social status. I'm too important to be seen with those people. I'm too important to hang out with those people. I'm too busy to stop for him. What would they say if I went to the bar and, and hung out with that guy? Doesn't mean I have to drink, but just being seen there, man, it might start those rumors, right? I know I could talk to him about Jesus, but I really don't, I don't, my reputation can't afford that right now. I, I, I just can't do that. I'm too important. What I have going on is too important. What my job is too important. What I am doing with my life is too important to sacrifice for that person. That's, that's, our, that's our train of thought. I, I don't have time. I don't have energy. I don't have the emotion. I don't have, the, I don't have the, the want to do that because what I got going is too important for them. Oh, wait. I have no self-importance. Because I could be replaced in an instant. I'm one in a million. And I should feel honored that God still chose me. Because why? Because I don't know it all. No matter how much I want to think I do, I don't know it all. Even in my profession, I don't know it all. There are people who can do my job better than me. I might be good, but I'm not the best. And I might be the best now, but eventually my body's going to give out and somebody else will be the best. Because I don't know it all. And I am not that important. But wow, God has chosen me. Here's one more thing I want to touch on this. And I meant to put this in your worship guide and I forgot about it. But I want, I want you to write this down if, 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 you, if, if you don't care, okay? Something that, that, another misconception about being humble that we have to understand is this. A lot of people think that being humble or having humility means that we don't care what people think about us. I'm here to, to debunk that. I believe, and I believe God says this, in order to be Christ followers, we do need to care what people think about us. But we need to care about the right things. Okay? I shouldn't care if that person gossips about me because I go to the bar to preach Jesus or to speak Jesus or to speak life or to share my testimony with my buddy who wants me to play pool with him. I'm doing what God wants me to do. So I'm not going to care that they choose to have a misconception about me because I'm doing what God wants me to do. But you know what I should care about? I should care about whether or not my attitude, my words, and how I represent myself is destroying their perspective of Jesus when that could be avoided. I should worry about what I'm saying whether or not it might make them not come back in those doors. I should worry about whether or not how I represent myself at my job, how I represent myself with my family, how I represent myself when people aren't looking. And I'm promising you guys, I'm struggling with humbleness and humility myself. I, I trust you that this week. I should be worried about how that is affecting their perspective of God. Because what they think about me in those type of moments can either make or break their chances 
of accepting Jesus, which has to be more important than anything else we do, leading people to Christ. The number one epidemic driving people out of church is hypocrisy from other Christ followers. Because we're not a very well-read Bible. We're human. We're going to screw up. We're going to have to vent sometimes. Man, I recently had a situation within my job where I needed to vent, and I did. It was overheard by someone who thought I was gossiping and started gossiping about me. And that ticked me off. But when I look back at the perspective, I realized, hey, you know what? Even though I needed a vent, couldn't I have done it at a different place? Couldn't I have done it in a different situation? Couldn't I have done it with a little more think thought through instead of with an angry and prideful attitude about what I thought should have been happening? Maybe then the whole situation could have been avoided. Right? Man, think about those perspectives. And, and, and I had to go around and, and I had to do uh, damage control for my own words with people I had been trying to represent Christ to. What if I didn't get that chance because the person that I had hurt was bold enough to look me in the eyes and said, I don't like you right now. <laughs> you know? Self-importance. Pride. What do people think about you? How do you represent Christ? The, the, the last thing that humbleness is, is this. It is a requirement for receiving God's blessing when you choose to serve Him. It is a requirement to receive God's blessing when you serve Him. Mark 9.35 says this, and this happens, the, the, the disciples are with Jesus and they're walking and heading to their new destination and, and they've been bickering among each other the whole way there. And when they finally stopped, Jesus says, what were you bickering about? And they were embarrassed because they knew they were bickering about something they shouldn't have been bickering, bickering about. And someone finally spoke up and said, well, we were talking about which one of us was the best disciple. Which one of us would have the highest place in the kingdom of heaven? Which one of us are, is the most important to you, Jesus? Hmm. And Jesus sat down. He said, all right, you, you want to be first then, huh? Yeah, we, want to be the, we all want to be in first place. We all want to be your best. We all want to be the most important disciple to you. So which one of us is it? Okay. Okay, well, let, let me answer your question this way, he says. In Mark chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus says this. He says, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. You want to be blessed by God? Stop asking for blessings. Oh, okay. Why? Am I saying don't ask God for stuff when you're in need? Absolutely not. But what, how, how selfish are your prayers? How much time do you spend asking God for stuff? And how much time do you spend asking God what He wants from you? You want to be first? Go to the end line. You want me to bless you? Serve others. Don't serve others because you want to be blessed, but serve others because you love me. If you want to, I, I have blessings waiting for you. I want to pour things out in your life like you cannot even imagine. The things I want for you are so big that you can't comprehend them. So you're not going to ask me for them because you can't even think of them in order to pray them. Okay, that's the type of blessings I want to give you. They're that big. But hey, guess what? Before I'm even willing to open up that floodgate, before I'm even willing to start turning that faucet onto a drip, you've got to learn to be last. You've got to learn to put others before yourself. You've got to learn to serve. You've got to learn that you're here because I chose you. And because I have a plan for you. And I need you to represent me. And I need you to serve. I don't need your opinion. I need my word in your life. That's it. First will be last. The last will be first. When you choose to humble yourself, when you choose to set aside your pride, then God will bless you. Why? Not because you want blessings, because you want His love. And that's it. And because you want to show that love to other people. Jesus said, Jesus went on to say in that same sentence, and I don't have that up here but in that same conversation he, he picks up a little kid and he sets that little kid on his on his lap and he wraps that little kid in his arms and he hugs him tight and he says do not deny any little kid like this to me treat this world the way I'm treating this child right now love them unconditionally wrap them in your arms show them the love of the father 
and do it out of your love for me. Not because you want a throne or a seat or a crown that's almost as pretty as mine, but simply because you love me. Because guess what? My crown wasn't very pretty because my crown was made of thorns. They didn't know that at the time. First will be last. Last will be first. Serve. And watch me bless you. I want to be humble. I want this. I want this life. I want to be this kind of leader. Guys, I don't care who you are. You're called to be a leader. Why? Because you represent Jesus Christ. People are looking at you to define what they think of the church as a whole. Okay? I want to be a leader that leads people towards Jesus. I want to care about the right opinions. I want to care about the right things. I don't want to care about my opinion. I don't want to care about getting my way. I say this a lot at work because I'm in training in the kitchen right now. I don't want it done my way. I want it done the right way. God is the right way, not my way. No highway rule with Jesus. It's His way. That's it. And I want to be humble. I want to be humiliated. Is there anybody else who stands with me today who wants to, humble, wants to be humbled by God? No one else? I want the humbleness of God. I want more of it. And some of you might have it, but I want more of it. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we receive the humbleness of God? How do we grasp this? How do we hold on to this? Okay, there's two ways we can do this. The first way is this. The first way is what I call the hard way. This is the hard way. This is not easy. Because you have to be willing to yank that pride out. You have to pull out that tar. And it hurts because it's connected. And it's going to rip at you some. And it's going to be painful. But you've got to rip out that tar. You've got to set this aside yourself. Okay? And you've got to go to God and say, God, I want you to humble me. God, I want to be your servant. God, I don't want the blessings I'm asking for. I want the blessings I can't fathom. And I want them out of my love for you and out of what I do for you. I want to build up, I want to build up treasures in heaven where moths cannot destroy. I want to work for you, Father. I want to be humbled by you. I want to be your slave. The Bible says that we are made free through Christ, but we become a slave to Him. Why? Because we are indebted to Him. And you've got to pay your debts. And tell you what, I want to be indebted to Christ. Why? Because He died for me. And I can never repay him, but I will be his slave. I will be his servant. I will humble myself for him. Are we ready to do that? The first way is the hard way. We've got to ask God. Second Chronicles 7.14 says this, Then if my people who call, are called by my name, what do people call us? They don't call us the bridge. They don't call us the Baptist. They don't call us General Baptist. What do they call us? They call us Christians. The first letters in Christian. C-H-R-I-S-T. Christ. We are called by His name. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. If my people who call by my name would humble themselves and pray, God... My pride, I want it gone. God, my agenda, I want it gone. God, my schedule, I want it gone. God, my finances, I want them gone. God, my job, I want it gone. God, my calling, my, my thoughts, I want them gone. I want you. I want everything to be about you. I want to be indebted to you. I want to be a slave to you. And I want to do whatever it takes for you. Why? Because this is not about my opinion. This is about the kingdom of heaven being built. This is not about the bridge going to a point of getting to build a new building and me getting a full-time paycheck. This is about the kingdom of heaven gaining new people. This is not just about Theodosia. This is about the world. This is not about me. This is about Jesus. And I want you. And I call upon your name. As someone who stands with the name of Jesus tattooed on his forehead... I call upon your name. I humble myself in your presence. I ask for forgiveness of my sins. I'm going to be, I'm going to be transparent with you. When I, when I stepped up to this altar and prayed during the second song, I, was call, I felt God wanted me up here. You know what I was doing? I was asking forgiveness of my sins for the things I knew I screwed up on this week. I was asking to be humbled. And I was asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I don't tell you that out of pride. I tell you that because God said, John, if you really want to get up there and you want to speak what I have for you, you better hit your knees and humble yourself first. And I set aside my pride. Guys, I'm wearing jeans right now. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm wearing jeans right now. I haven't fit in these in two years. I've lost 26 pounds. And I finally buttoned these. And that's great. But the thing about them is they're still pretty tight. And I thought, what if my butt crack shows? I really thought that. And then I thought, I'll show my butt crack for Jesus, I guess, man. I'm going up there. 
I'm going to humble myself. Why? Because that's humility. Because I don't care. I'm here for God. I don't care about that opinion. I only care about the opinion that matters. And that's my Christ. And that's what people think about Christ because of how I represent my life. That's the hard way. Ask God for, for it. Second way is this. Probably thinking the easy way. Nope. It's the harder way. This is the harder way. This is the tough way. The harder way. Wait and let God force it on you. Those who are called by His name will be humbled eventually. Those who are true followers of Christ, He will catch up with you one way or another. Okay? My mom used to say this about my grades. If they're bad, you're going to get grounded, you're going to get talked to. But if you tell me, it will be a whole lot worse than if I have to find out on my own. That's what God's saying right now. You can, talk, you can call on my name or you can let me come hunt you down. You want to see what happens when you get hunted down by God? This is the story of King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. He had multiple dreams and Daniel would interpret them. One day he had this dream and he went to Daniel and Daniel said, well, all this stuff is going to happen to you and God's going to humble you and He's going to rip everything away from you. You can stop this if you choose right now to humble yourself and admit that He is king and you are not that you're an earthly king and he is a heavenly king. He's the only true God. If you choose to admit that right now, you can avoid this all. It's not going to be an easy path because you're going to have to apologize to people. You're going to have to rip your pride out of your heart. You're going to have to admit that you've been wrong about stuff. You're going to lose face in front of people. You're going to have to ask for forgiveness. But it's the easier way than what you got coming. And Nebuchadnezzar says, yeah, nah, I'm good. So then one day it says this, Daniel chapter 4, verse 28. But all these things did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, one year after that, that vision, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of his royal palace in Babylon. And this is what he says. As he looked around across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. I did this. Look at what I did. Look at my power. Look at my splendor. Look at my... Glory, look at what I've done. Look at what my opinions have created. Look at what my visions have created. Look at what my hands. He didn't even build them with his own hands. He probably had thousands of people who died building this stuff for him. But it was his hands that supposedly did it. Listen to this. While the words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer the ruler of this kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals and you will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone He chooses. That same hour, judgment was fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from his human society. He ate grass like a cow. He was drenched with the dew of the heaven. He lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. After this time had passed, I, this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking now, after this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven and my sanity returned. I praised and I worshipped the Most High and honored the One who lives forever. Listen, when our pride and our lack of humbleness is hiding our sin. It's hiding our hurts. It's hiding our true sense of having no self-worth. When it's hiding our, 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 it's hiding all of our bad stuff away behind our pride and our opinions. God says, listen, if you truly love me, I'm going to catch up with you. You can choose to follow me now. Or you can let me chase you with the baseball bat. One way or another, I'm going to get you. One way is going to be a little bit prettier than the other but I'll catch up with you. Some of us have been there, right? Some of us have been in the lows of the lows. Some of us have had to admit the things that we're not proud of. Some of us have had to make those apologies and not because we wanted to, but because we were backed into a corner and we didn't have a choice. And we realized, wow, it's either do the right thing or fall off the cliff. And I'm not falling off the cliff. So we have a choice today. We can choose the hard way. We can choose to say, this isn't about me. This isn't about my opinion. This isn't about my face, the saving face, and saving my reputation. But this is about God, and I will humble myself. I will be bold. 
I will be a man or a woman who stands for Christ, and I will, for the lack of a better term, for both genders, I'm sorry, I will grow a pair. I will step up. I will face it. I will say I'm sorry where I've got to say I'm sorry. I'll do the right thing. I will be humbled, and I will follow from this day forward after Jesus Christ. Or we can continue to ignore our pride and our lack of humility and everybody else can watch us as we fall. If we as a body of Christ, and I'm almost done, if we as a body of Christ, as the Bridge Church, as a whole, and I'm not pointing out a person here, I'm talking about us as a whole, as a family, as a movement, as a living organism growing and wanting to change lives for Jesus, if we cannot humble ourselves, we will die. Guys, I'm not speaking this. Uh, I'll, I'll be straight up with you. As a pastor, there's always things that worry me, and I got lots of things on my mind. But this is a general statement here. As a whole, we have to choose to humble ourselves. We have to choose to set aside our opinions and to do only what Jesus wants from us. From the moment we walk in here on a Sunday morning to the moment we leave and every other moment in between as we represent Jesus, we wear the Bridge Church shirt, we keep the business cards and the pins in our hand and we wear the cross around our neck. We have to humble ourselves and say, hey, I want the attitude of Christ from this day forward because I don't want a single person to go to hell over the way I acted or over the fact that I couldn't put myself aside. Because if we don't do that, what Jesus is going to say, what God's going to say is, I love you, but the Bridge Church, you just became my opposition. And you're really not that important. And I'm going to go down here to one of these other churches, and I'm going to talk to someone down there, and they're going to start doing what I wanted you to do. Now, I had a vision for them, and they did their vision well at that other church. But your vision, the vision I had for you was so important, there's someone down there who's willing to do it. So I'm going to go to them. Guys, and I'm not bashing any other church in this community. You know that. That's not me. They've got their vision, and I love them for it. But I'm telling you, if we don't choose to do what God wants from us, on every level, from the small to the big, He'll move on. We'll close our doors, and no one will remember who we are. But if we choose to do what He wants, this community will never forget the impact of Jesus Christ.